Hi, my name is Ricky Howe. I'm the director of the Wesley Foundation at Winthrop University, as well as one of the pastors that helps to coordinate the students and mission program. Uh, if you never heard of SIM, it is a ministry of our annual conference that has gone on now for 45 years, where we allow young people in our conference, college students, to get out to different ministries and to be in mission and to be in service for the summer. Uh, this year we will have five different sites um, at Rural Mission in Johns Island, at Brooklyn United Methodist Church in Columbia, uh, at Transition and Washington Street United Methodist Church in Columbia, uh, as well as Aldersgate United Methodist Church in Charleston. Uh, one of our students is not able to appear in the video, Mac and Wall, and she will be serving with Transitions and with um, Washington Street. Um, but now, let's hear from the rest of our students. My name is Thomasina Thomas, and I'll be attending the University of South Carolina in the fall as a sophomore, and I'll be serving at Aldersgate United Methodist Church in Charleston. My name is Jordan Blackwell. I'll be a senior at Lander University in the fall, and I'll be serving at Brooklyn United Methodist Church in Columbia this summer. Hello, I'm Desiree Hood. I am a junior at Winthrop University, and I will be serving at Rural Missions in Johns Island this summer. My name is Sarah Davis. I will be attending Winthrop in the fall as a junior, and I'll be serving at Rural Mission on Johns Island. This year, the Advocacy Ministry area discerned the need to deal with the issues of racism, sexism, classism, and the gulf in relationship between law enforcement and the community, especially communities of color. Four racial healing events have already taken place this year, starting with more than 100 clergy and laity participating in a vital conversations on race workshop in the Charleston District. The Columbia and Anderson Districts hosted racial healing events in April, and additional events are scheduled for the Marion and Walterboro Districts. Perhaps the most compelling action on racial reconciliation came earlier this year when Trinity United Methodist Church in Charleston, an historically white congregation, chose to mark its 225th year anniversary by issuing a formal apology to Centenary United Methodist Church in Charleston, an historically African-American congregation. Both churches traced their heritage back to the city's first formal Methodist church, Cumberland Street Methodist Church, which was formed in 1785. The resolution from Trinity reads in part, the contemporary congregation of Trinity United Methodist Church acknowledges the discrimination Trinity's white members inflicted against its black members, creating segregation within its faith community. We express regret for the sins of our predecessors, mourn their acts of divisiveness, and ask to show our love for one another by sharing in joint events, worship, congregation development, and mission programs. The harsh lesson to learn from our history is this. We stand stronger united rather than divided. We need to get to know each other so as to demonstrate our sincere desire to end the racial tensions which have continued throughout the centuries. And in hopes this one initial step at achieving unity will encourage other congregations to do the same. We are the United Methodist Church. Advocacy also focused this year on the work of the Ethnic and Local Church Concerns Committee. Greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ. I am the facilitator of the South Carolina Conference Committee on Ethnic Local Church Concerns, or ELCC. I'm delighted to be here to uh, share with you some of the things that ELCC is engaged in within the South Carolina Conference. One of the things is we are called to teach, and that is to train, to educate, to affirm, to communicate, and to heal. We provide scholarships that allow folks to go and participate, hands-on experiences, that they can come back into their local churches and share within the church so that they can strengthen the ministries of the church. ELCC also provides uh, funding for grants twice a year, and we um, offer opportunities for local churches to seek funds to help in ministry areas that can strengthen the local churches, its people, and the community as a whole. If you're interested in a grant from ELCC, you can find the grant application on the conference website at www.umcsc.org.
Floods and rains have impacted families in 24 counties of South Carolina since October of 2015. Since that time, through the efforts of more than 3,000 volunteers and the prayers of countless others, South Carolina Annual Conference's Recovery Ministries have restored 140 homes in 17 of those counties. The work that we do as part of Disaster Recovery Ministries is funded primarily from donations from UMCOR and from state grants like SC1 and donations from churches and individuals. So far, we've spent over $400,000 uh, on materials and other recovery needs. Every client we work with is unique and has different recovery needs. That's why clients are assigned a disaster case manager, someone who can help walk them through the recovery process step by step and identify critical needs. The case management process is the first and often most critical step in getting a family back in their home. Our disaster case managers are there to connect and refer clients to essential resources that will help clients obtain clean clothing, food, furniture, or appliances, and in some cases, temporary housing. It ruined the um, inside of some of the walls of the home, uh, the carpeting, the padding on all of the floors and the carpeting and all of the floors and it um, created mold. We lived in a camper for six months in our driveway. We lived in two hotels and um, we're just so grateful for what you've done for us. It's devastating, absolutely devastating. There is really no way to explain the horror or the feeling of not being able to live in your house. The flood of 2015 and Hurricane Matthew in 2016 hit areas in different intensities. So each area we work in produces a new set of issues to be addressed. Some homes need an entirely new roof. Some only need a minor roof repair. While other homes with mold issues may need several rooms completely mucked out and then rebuilt from the studs. Our work includes structural repair, sheetrock replacement, floors, ceiling repair, and painting. Mrs. Taylor's home was mucked out to the studs and completely rebuilt by volunteers. The flood came that morning, I guess about two or three, and um, it blew up, blew up my, my top of my house. So happened I wasn't here. I went to my sister. When I came back, my whole house was caved in. Water was on my floor that high. Both bedrooms full of water. They did my floor first. Then um, they did my bathroom. Then they paint my house. Then they just work. And I need a lot of work done to my house, and I didn't know where I was gonna go. So God just stepped in and gave me a blessing. So I just got a new house. I mean, a brand new house. Never, my house ain't looked this good since, I don't know when. I'm just overwhelmed. I can't think of nothing else to say that I'm blessed. I don't know what else to say, because everybody was so good to me. Everybody I met with, it's like I knew them all my life. Good people. Unfortunately, the 2015 floods aren't the only disaster we are now faced with. Hurricane Matthew also left a significant number of damaged homes. While our work on assessing the long-term needs related to Hurricane Matthew is just beginning, we know that our long-term disaster recovery will be actively engaged in recovery efforts into 2019. All of these efforts require a team of people to assist families in recovering from a disaster. That requires a staff of a director, construction supervisors, disaster case managers, volunteer coordinator, and of course an administrative assistant. Of course the work cannot be completed without volunteers that come in from across the state and from around the country to work on houses that are in need of repair. Recovery staff works collaboratively and cooperatively with local long-term recovery groups and state organizations. Disaster Recovery Ministries operates year-round, which enables us to continue coordination with our fellow long-term recovery partners. It is important that everyone affected by either declared disaster is able to prove eligibility and then be assisted during the recovery phase of this journey. We coordinate with these long-term recovery groups to prevent a duplication of effort amongst homeowners and to help us find underserved counties. 
Our disaster case managers have referred more than 100 of our clients to the South Carolina Disaster Recovery Office's Rebuild Program, so clients have the chance to receive the most valuable assistance for their situation. Thank you for your continued contribution of time, gifts, and talents. Your efforts bring hope to families in need of safe, sanitary, and secure homes. But our work is not done. Hundreds of families still need our help. Look in the back of your registration packet to find this page. It tells you how to contact us, and we ask that you put together a team and let us know when you can come. No one wanted to help us, and the United Methodist Church was, was one that rised up and said, we're going to help you. And you did. And without you, we wouldn't be in, living in our home today. We would like to thank churches who have sent volunteers and also churches who have offered to host volunteers in their facilities. My name is Millie Nelson-Smith, and I'm the Congregational Specialist for the Hartsville District, the Columbia District, and African American Ministries. Healthy churches make disciples. Healthy churches are communities of faith reaching out into their community, nurturing the people and drawing them closer to God and closer to each other. Healthy churches are also churches that are growing and demonstrating the love of Jesus Christ. Beginning last fall, Bishop Holston began the Forward Focus Tour that ended in April. He and his team went to each district sharing his vision and introducing clergy and laity alike to the forward focus process. Well, those 12 events were very well attended and they were very exciting, but the bishop didn't travel to each district just to get everyone excited. He came with a plan to put their energy to use in a way that would benefit the local church. Working with his cabinet, extended cabinet, and the Connectional Ministries team, Bishop Holston challenged us to move forward with a God-sized dream, forward focus. Forward focus is a process of looking at your church's health, assessing what your church health is by looking at your worship attendance, the history of your church, and finances for the past 10 years. It also looks at your community, who lives there, and we'll be answering some questions. The questions are, who are we? Who is our neighbor? What are we here for? And what are we going to do about it? This is all done by a team of people from the congregation along with the pastor a forward team, and a forward leader. A person assigned to you by the district superintendent who has been trained to lead you through this process. At the end of the process, a congregation should know what its current reality is. You know, its current situation. Who the people are with whom we need to connect, what God is calling us to be and to do, how can we faithfully move forward to respond to God's calling, and what our next steps will be. Maybe you're wondering what makes Forward Focus different. Well, number one, it's not a program. It's an assessment. Secondly, it's not long or drawn out. It takes from three to six months. And finally, the church's forward team does the work and the congregation is included all along the way. So everyone has the opportunity to be on board. So far, more than 125 churches have said yes to forward focus. St. Andrew's United Methodist Church in Orangeburg was the very first church to complete the process. If you get a chance this week, ask pastors Robert and Carol Cannon or their lay leader Ron Turnblad and they will tell you that the process was a good experience for them as a congregation. Having their forward leader Art Rose come alongside them, they have considered what their next steps should be and have created a plan to implement them. If you would like to know more about Forward Focus, talk with your pastor and have him or her contact your congregational specialist. We would love to hear from you.